Okay, good afternoon everyone. So assignment six is available up at the front over here. Uh, assignment five will be coming, it's just different TAs grading in, so they're coming in different order. Assignment six is available today already, assignment five will be available in the next day's class. So I bring the wrong day. <laughs> okay, so uh, the class of fractional factorials last time we started to investigate why we need to do fractional factorials. I put up a very strong statement here. I don't agree with it in every instance, but um, pretty much in most instances, you should always be doing a fractional factorial. Does that include for your project? Let's take a look at that by the end of the class. Let's come back to that question. So fractional factorials, here's an example of a company that would not be able to do a full factorial in a reasonable time frame. We discussed that last time. They would take about 320 days, assuming nothing goes wrong, just to complete the full factorial. It's a waste of experiments because those 32 experiments with estimate 32 parameters, we really don't need 32 parameters. So many of those high-level interactions, so if we've got five parameters, we've got A, B, C, D, E assigned to these five parameters over here that we're investigating, or five factors, I should say. Many of the interactions, so for example, the B, C, D, E interaction, that four-factor interaction is likely insignificant. And there's several four-factor interactions. There's one five-factor interaction, there's several three-factor interactions. All of those are likely not important. We really only need to investigate the main effects and two-factor interactions at best. How do we go about structuring our experiments to do that? So we started this example and we said, well, let's assume we had a full factorial with three factors. So the three factors would be eight experiments. Here's the full experimental table for that situation. We have our A, B, and C written in the usual way. So our alternating signs for A, slower frequency for B, and the slowest frequency for C. The other columns are formed by the products. So A, B column, A, C, B, C, and the A, B, C columns are just the natural multiplication of those signs. What if the full experiment, which we're saying we shouldn't do, how do we take the reduced number of experiments, the half fraction, so we want to only execute four of these eight rows. Which four rows do we pick was a discussion we had last time. And we said that visually, if we looked at those four runs on the cube, you can either execute the runs with the closed circle or the open circle. It doesn't matter which your choice is. And the reason for that choice is that later on, you will invariably find one of the main effects is not significant, in which case, that full factorial will collapse, that fractional factorial will collapse down to a full factorial in the remaining two factors. So the one example was if we find that this direction C going in and out of the board here is not significant, we would have to form a full factorial in the factors of A and B anyway from those four experiments we chose. Similarly for the other cases, we get the same result. So one of the questions that came up after the class, well, how do you know that that factor is not significant? We're going to look at that analysis a bit today, and it ends up coming down to the three of In the same way we judged earlier whether factors are important or not, by looking at the magnitude of the bar on the leader plot, it's exactly going, exactly the same strategy here for fractional factorials. But there's going to be another issue coming up with fractional factorials. Since we've done half the number of experiments in this particular case, the first thing you're going to be asking yourself is, what are you losing out on? And we're clearly going to lose out on our ability to estimate some of the interactions, but what else has gone on? And that's what we're going to answer in today's class. And this table here is the key table that helps us figure out what our trade-offs are. What we, this table will be able to very quickly read in a week from now and make a judgment on which experimental situation you prefer to be in. These Roman numerals here will tell you a lot of information on what you're going to lose out. So that's coming up in the, in the next class. Today, we're going to look at what these bold letters mean and, and interpret that. We started to look at that actually last time already. We said, let's go back to this case where we've got three factors, A, B, and C. So here's my three factors. So a full factorial 
is two to the three or eight experiments. We're only going to do a half fraction. How do we find the four experiments? Well, the table tells me a half fraction is four experiments. The table tells me how to set up that experiment. So four experiments in three factors. So four experiments, four runs, investigating three factors. The table tells me to use C equals AB. generate that set of experiments. The generators are the bold letters there in the bottom right hand corner. So we generate our experiment by setting the C equal to AB. Because I'm only running four experiments, four experiments implies the full factorial in two factors. So I take my factor A and B, we just work from the beginning, A and B, those two factors, and I generate the full factorial in the usual manner. Minus, plus, minus, plus. B is minus, minus, plus, plus. You'll always find then that your next factor to generate, C, is going to be from your generator. So this tells you, and the name is descriptive of what you're going to do, you're going to generate the C factor from the product of A and B. So C in this instance is plus, so the first experiment, the product is minus, minus. The next experiment is C is going to be run at the low level, the product is plus and minus, another minus, and then the final level for C is a plus. So we have this new term that's coming up, confounding, we'll investigate some today's class. We notice that the A column minus, plus, minus, plus in standard order, has the same pattern as the BC column. The BC column is also minus, plus, minus, plus. So I'm going, whatever A is in my experiment, in those four experiments, is the same as BC. A is going and changing in exactly the same manner that BC is changing. So that's already warning me here that whatever I estimate the effect of A to be is going to be mixed up or confounded with whatever the effect of BC is. I will not be able to tell after my experiment if what was happening was due to A or if it was due to the BC interaction because I've intentionally gone and confounded the BC effect with the A's effect. I also notice that the column of B has the same pattern as the AC column, two minuses, two pluses. Again, here, I will not be able to tell B apart, the effect of B apart from the AC interaction. Similarly, from C's effect, it's plus, minus, minus, plus, is the same pattern as AB, plus, minus, minus, plus. That was intentional. That was, in fact, how we generated this experiment. We created factor C as the product of A. So I already know automatically that however A and B is on, the, on, on my y variable. It could be due to C, or it could be due to A, B, or it could be due to both. I just cannot tell. That's what we use from our fractional factorial. If I had done the whole factorial, I would have been able to estimate the effect of A, B, and C. I would have been able to estimate A, B effect on its own. I would have been able to estimate A, C, B, C, and A, B, C all on their own. Because a full factorial, I could have estimated eight slope coefficients, eight effects. But because I've done half the number of experiments, I can't expect to be able to estimate the full effect of those eight factors. I can't expect something for nothing. So we can tell that also by looking at the least squares representation. Half fractions or any fractional factorial, we can use the least squares model to determine what our trade-offs are. If I write out the least squares model, this is what my x matrix would look like. It's just a copy and paste of that previous table. <coughs> One thing I notice, though, is that x is not orthogonal. So my first column here 
matches exactly my last column. So those two columns are collinear. X is not an orthogonal matrix anymore. If I form X transpose X and try to invert it, it will crash. Your computer will not calculate X transpose X and then invert it. Okay, because you've got these two columns and get a perfectly collinear. You've got this column here, minus, plus, minus, plus, that matches this column over here. Minus, minus, plus, plus, and plus, minus, minus, plus. These columns here also match. So you've got four columns replicated twice. Okay. So I cannot calculate next time because it's in this. So what we do then is, well, we recognize that fact, and we collapse the, the columns that are similar, or that are identical, I should say, and group up our slope coefficients. So my plus, 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 plus column was due to my intercept, but it was also the column due to the ABC three-factor interaction. So what I say then is, well, let me group those two columns together, and this coefficient I'm going to estimate in that first position in the B vector is not the effect of the intercept, nor is it the effect of ABC interaction, it's the sum of them. So that coefficient that I estimate is a blend of my intercept and it's a blend of the three-factor interaction. The next coefficient down, this would have been in the usual position, this would have been the, the usual effect of A on its own. But I'm not going to be able to estimate the slope or the effect of A on its own. I'm going to blend that up and confound it with the BC interaction. Now, if I know the BC interaction is not significant in my process or is not likely to actually exist, I might have a first principles understanding of the system I'm dealing with. And I could be pretty sure ahead of time that BC, that slope is, not, is zero or close to zero. Then it's okay, then I'm, then I'm happy because I know from a first principles point of view that this is going to be zero or small. And so this coefficient I will ultimately estimate will be the pure effect of A. If I don't know that ahead of time though, I will not be able to tell the effect of A apart from BC. So if I get a large significant coefficient here, either a positive value or a negative value, I will not be able to tell if that is the effect of A on the system or if that's the effect of BC on the system. And same for the other two sets of coefficients. So what we form here then essentially is what we call our confounding pattern. This intercept and ABC term up here would have normally been called beta zero term. But it's not going to be an estimate of beta zero. It's now the effect of my intercept plus the ABC three-factor interaction. The second term over here is the blend of A plus BC. This term over here is the B plus AC. And then the lastly, the beta C I would have estimated is the effect of C plus AB. So that's telling me what I'm trading off. I'm, I'm losing something absolutely by doing a half fraction. I'm losing my ability to clearly tell main effects apart from these two-factor interactions. These two-factor interactions are going to be blended up with my main effects. Now, <coughs> here's the key issue. When I've done this experiment, I get these four slope coefficients afterwards, I can draw a Pareto plot of these four coefficients. Let's assume that this coefficient beta c, which is the effect of c plus ab, let's assume that is small. That slope coefficient for c plus ab is small. It's telling me that neither c nor ab are playing an important role on this y variable. So neither my main effect of c nor the two-factor interaction with a and b together have any significance on affecting y. That tells me right away I can go drop out factor c. Okay. So now I've eliminated c from my experiment. My only two factors remaining are a and b. And I've done a full factorial in terms of a and b. Right? Because I did four experiments, I've only now got factor a and b and the AB interaction remaining. C is gone. So if, if I've taken factor C out of, out of consideration, this BC interaction falls away, that AC interaction falls away. And I've done four experiments in A and B 
and I can estimate the full factorial in terms of A and B. Geometrically or visually, for those of you that prefer it, what I've done is I've said back to C, this direction going in and out of the board here has disappeared. I've determined that the C plus AB two-factor interaction, that what I wrote earlier is beta C, which is the effect of C plus AB. I've determined or I've seen that this coefficient is small. So that means that either C is small or AB is small, or both are small. I can delete them out of the model. In other words, factor C disappears. This direction in and out of the board goes away. I might as well have done the experiment originally without factor C. I've done four experiments, and it's collapsed to a few factorial in terms of A and B. So I've recovered exactly the experiments I would have done if I had known ahead of time C was not important. This is why fractional factorials are so great to use, and you should always use them. Rather, put variables into consideration, because later on you're going to find that some of them are not significant, you will recover the full set of experiments you would have done anyway, had you known prior to doing your experiments that those variables were not important. Okay, so you always will recover your work back, but you will have the confirmation now for sure that that variable was not important. Prior to doing the experiment, all you were doing is speculating that C was not important. Now you've got certainty that it is not important. Okay, so for example, some of you might be doing experiments on bouncing balls. You might be considering that your choice of the dollar store ball versus the expensive sports, talk, sports store version of the ball has some effect on Y, but maybe you're like, well, no, really, it shouldn't have an effect on Y. So you're guessing. If you do your experiment afterwards, you find that the variable has no effect, you've not lost anything. You've done the same amount of work, but at least now you've got confirmation that it has no importance. Okay, so fractional factorials are all are a must. Something you should be doing. Let's take a look now at some of the mathematics behind it. So we're going to create some new terminology here to deal with fractional factorials. Because for some for a small system with three factors, doing a half fraction for experiments, it's easier to do it on paper. But if you're dealing with six factors, so two to the six factorial, that's now 64 experiments. What's confounded with what? What's what what's going on here? That's a lot harder to deal with. So we need a systematic way of dealing with this. Let's take a look. One thing before we go take a look at, I just want to introduce this terminology here. When we say A plus BC is blended up here together, we say that the factor A is an alias for BC. Alias means another name for. So A is simply another name for BC. AC is an alias for B, B is an alias for AC. So we can interchange these, these roles. So you'll sometimes see that terminology used in experiments. So let's take a look now at what we call aliasing notation. So the general rule is as follows for half fractions. So I've got 2 to the k factorial. I want to write down k minus 1 factors. So if I've got k equals 4, that implies I've got a system where I've got four factors, a, b, c, d, write down k minus 1 of the main factors. So in other words, in this case, k minus 1 would be write down factors for a, b, and c. And I will generate the last factor, d, from the product of the previous ones. So half fractions always have this feature, that the final variable that you're considering is the product of the, of the variables going ahead of it. That's shown in the table as well. So for this half fraction, we're considering four factors. So k is equal to 4. The table tells me the generator is d is a, b, c. Let's just go, go see how I found that. So here's my, my trade-off table. I'm investigating four factors, so that immediately locks down this column for me. If I was doing a full factorial, I'd have 2 to the 4 experiments, I'd have 16. So that's this, this column, that row corresponds to a full factorial in two, two terms, called a 2 to the 4 experiment. If I wanted to do a half fraction, that bumps me one row up. Now I'm going to only do 8 runs. 
it's a 2 to the 4 minus 1 factorial. I generate D as the product of A, B, and C. That's my generator. So this is called my generator. So that's, that's terminology we've seen before. Let's add some new semantics to the system. If that's my generator, and there's only one generator on the table, aliasing notation has the following rules. We can say that the product of one factor with itself is the identity. So A multiplied by A is the identity. That's a rule. So there's no reasoning behind it. We just use that as a rule. B multiplied by B is I. C multiplied by C is I. D multiplied by D is I. All of them. A factor multiplied by itself gives identity. Identity multiplied by itself is your identity. Let's take a look at writing out what is ABC times D as an example. ABC multiplied by D, well D is generated as the product of ABC. So if I substitute in D, I substitute in ABC for this D over here because that's my generator. I can then write it out as A, A, B, B, C, C, but the product of two factors with each self is I, I, I. I multiplied by I gives you I. <coughs> so here I could write down, using this new set of rules I've just taught you over here, using those rules, I can simplify that A, B, C times D is equal to I. Or in other words, A, B, C, D is equal to I. This is called my defining relationship. This is new terminology, no, defining relationship. And I'm going to use my defining relationship to find what variables are confounded with each other. The defining relationship is the key, the key tool to figuring that out. So on the next slide over, the defining relationship is defined as the product of all generator combinations solved for i on the left hand side. So let's take a look at what that means. My generator, in this case, was d is equal to abc. So d equals abc. It says the product of all generator combinations, but solved for i on the left hand side. Well, the product of all generator combinations is d multiplied by abc. But I need to solve for i on the left hand side. Well, d is equal to abc. d is equal to abc from this previous relationship multiplied by abc. That simplifies to A, A, B, B, C, C, which simplifies to I, 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 which simplifies to I. So all of these are equivalent to each other. So the product of all my generator combinations solved for I on the left hand side, I can write as I is equal to A, B, C. That's my defining relationship, and that's how I get it. It's easy in this case because my generator only has two words. There's another new term here. Each one of these on the, each side is called a word. So for any experimental block in that trade-off table, I can quickly find my defining relationship as the product of all generated combinations solved for i, the identity on the left-hand side. Once I have my defining relationship expressed as i equals something, I can now go use that to find which variables are alias with which other variables. Or in other words, what are the interactions in my system? Uh, sorry, what are the confounding patterns in my system? So, in this case where I have four factors, I've got a 2 to the 4 factorial, minus 1, so that's 8 experiments. I have four factors A, B, C, D. I would like to know ahead of time, I know that ahead of time 
A, the effect of A, beta and A, I should say, is not going to be the estimate of the pure effect of A alone. Okay? We know that when we do a half fraction, we lose something. We lose our ability to tell the effects apart from each other on a pure basis. We know that there's going to be confounding. So what is going to be confounded with this slope coefficient beta A? We know beta A is going to estimate the effect of A, but it's also going to be blended up or confounded with the effect of something else. Which interaction? Is it going to be a two-factor interaction? Is it going to be a three-factor interaction? Is it going to even be a four-factor interaction? Four factors. Well, we can tell quite easily. Use the following. I want to know what A is going to be confounded by. <coughs> Multiply it by the defining relationship. What is that in this case? That is A times I. A times I is still A. Okay. But let me substitute in what I is for my defining relationship. I is A, B, C, D, E, and A, B, C, D. Let's simplify that a bit. That's A, A, B, C, D. A, A is I, B, C, D, just B, C, D. So using that new notation or those new rules we introduced on the previous slide, we can find what A is alias with. A is going to be alias with BCE. So this slope coefficient for A is not going to be the pure effect of A. It's going to be blended up or confounded with this three-factor interaction due to B, C, and D. Work out for yourself what B is going to be alias with. And the next uh, two or three on the So here's the detailed derivation for it. You're going to be able to jump through this quite quickly without even thinking it. What's D alias with? D is alias with ABC. Is that a surprise? That's exactly how we generated this design. We, when we created my experiments, I set factor D equal to the product of ABC. So it's no surprise then that when I, when I go through this new system that I uncover that result. We, we in fact created our experiment in that way. What is the AB factor alias with? AB is alias with CD. AC, ED. And BCD. BCD is A just with I? Okay. A. So it's exactly what we had up here. A is A just with BCD. BCD is A just with A. So you, it's, it's always uh, symmetrical that way. Okay, so you can go back to that simple example we looked at earlier and, and prove to yourself the aliasing pattern that we discovered over here. Prove to yourself 
in this example, we went through it looking at it at the least squares model and we looked at which columns are similar to each other and we grouped them up and we found this confounding pattern. Very simple to do in this small example, but not doable in the case of four factors, five factors, because then you're going to be writing out these large X matrices and trying to figure out the patterns that's too, too tedious in your problem. But make sure that you can recover this same information using that new mathematical tools I've introduced here. So that's, that's your task to try and own, to make sure that you're comfortable using this new notation. Any, any questions on this so far? Um, if you look at like the simple thing where you have to take a three factorial you know, and half fraction, what happens if all of your, uh, if you do the three of five, all of them are significant? Okay, good question. So what if in a small system you do your half fraction and you find that your four factors you've estimated in that in an ABC example, or the half fraction for uh, three factors, if all your factors are significant, do they need to separate anything out? Right, you can't drop out any terms and simplify. Maybe you have no Right. Then you have to do the full factorial. Okay, but now at least you've got guidance that says, here's why you need to go if you had just gone and done your experiments, all eight experiments, you could have done four extra experiments that you really didn't need to do, and you've wasted your money. So you could have gone away with four experiments, and you've gone and done eight, you would have recovered all that information anyway. Okay? In fact, if you had gone and done those experiments, and you found out afterwards that only A and B only A and B were significant variables, and C is dropped out. But you've gone and done eight experiments. What you've gone and done is you've done a full factorial twice. So you've essentially gone and done the replicates at every corner. You've done an experiment for A, B, eight times at those points. So you've doubled your budget and you've wasted half or doubled the money you spent. So this is why fractional factorials are so critical to do because they give you the guidance whether you should spend your full budget or not. And if you don't need to spend your budget, you recover almost the same information as if you've done the full factorial. So now let's take a look at it. Well, the next natural question is, well, can I do, instead of a half fraction, can I do a quarter fraction? Or instead of a quarter fraction, can I do a one-eighth fraction? And how far can you go, right? What's your limit? There must be a limit to how far we can go, right? Eventually we can do no experiments, so at least you get no information. But if I keep halving and halving, where's, where's my, my limits here? So here's what we're going to do now. We're going to go all the way to the limit. So instead of just doing a half fraction, which, is the, which might seem like a good strategy, well, there's actually a better strategy. The better strategy is what's called the saturated design. You go to the most for the highest level of fractionation possible. It is the fewest number of experiments for a given number of variables. Okay? And I will argue that this is where you should be starting your DAE projects. You sit down and you plan, I want to investigate why. Write down on a piece of paper every possible factor you want to consider. Then you say to yourself, well, I've got this amount of time to do the work. I'm going to allocate a weekend or one day or whatever the time is. Well, how many experiments is that? And you know how many factors you've got. Can I do as many of those factors in that given time frame? What that essentially comes down to is when you've got this table here, you move up from bottom to top. So if you've written down eight variables that affect y, You've got eight variables. You could go do the two to the eight factorial, which I don't even know what it is. It's like 256 experiments. That's too many. Or you could go do two to the seven, or I should write two to the eight minus one. Or you could go do a two to the eight minus two. If you want to go to the highest level of saturation, 
all you do is you go to your column of eight, that's the number of factors you've written down, and you go up as far as you can go until you reach your, first, your highest known empty block. The fewest number of experiments you can do is 16. You can't do any fewer than that. And this is telling you how to set up that experiment. So you're going to have to do 16 experiments. That implies it's a full factorial in terms of A, B, C, and D, four factors. You're going to generate factor E, F, G, and H according to those generators within the graph. If you're investigating seven experiments, the fewest number of variables, no, sorry, the fewest number of runs you could go use is eight. So seven factors, the fewest experiments is eight. And that's true for factors six, five, and four. So this is a good rule of thumb. If anyone's, if you're in a meeting with your colleagues and you have to ask, and they ask you what's the fewest number of experiments we can do, almost always the correct answer is eight. <laughs> You'll be able to investigate four, five, six, or seven factors in eight experiments. Extremely powerful. And there's the generators. So the generator, you, you put in two E's, A, B, C. If you're investigating five factors, you generate E from A, B, and E from A, C, and so forth. We're going to look at this one here, this very, very saturated design in the upcoming classes, or upcoming class. So, Saturated designs are those designs where you simply move up the table as high as you possibly can go and you, and you use those generators over there. So let's take a look at that. We might as well take a look at that example um, now, actually. We've got seven factors, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. We could run a full factorial, that's 128 experiments. We don't have time for that. 64 runs, a half fraction, that estimates 64 parameters. But think of that, you've got a least squares model with 64 coefficients and x values. So 64 slopes and 64 x's, right? You're not even going to be able to print that on a piece of paper in front of you and investigate it. It's not going to mean anything for you. Or I could go do 32 experiments and estimate 32 parameters. Or I could go as low as eight experiments investigating seven factors. How do we design that experiment? How do we set up those eight runs in the seven variables? Well, we follow the rules. The rule says we're doing eight experiments. Eight experiments means it's a full factorial in terms of A, B, and C. We write them up in standard order. The next step says to generate factors D, E, F, and G. We generate them according to the generators from the table. So D is the product of A, B. So my first experiment in standard order is the product of A, B, minus, minus, gives me a plus. Second experiment, plus, minus, gives me a minus. So notice here, so we see these patterns recur. Plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus. Your E factor, your fifth variable, is the product of A times C. So plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, plus. F is B, C. And your final factor, G, is the product of A, B, and C. This is the table you go and give to your operators to go run the experiments, or you go do it yourself if you're the junior engineer. There's your seven factors you're investigating. There's how you run those experiments in those seven variables. So you pick up a row randomly from this table, say row four. I would go run experiment from row four with high level of A, high level of B, low level of C, high level D, low E, low F, low G. So this is telling me how to execute that experiment. I run my experiment and then I add a column to this table with the corresponding Y value, whatever the outcome is that I'm interested in measuring, or outcomes. In many cases, you've got more than one outcome, so you record all your outcomes possible. Now, we can do this next step, actually, without even doing the experiments. This is the crucial part. This is why we actually consider ASM. Because I want to know, before I actually even do the experiments, what is going to be alias with what? What is going to be confounded with what? And I can do that ahead of time. I don't have to do the experiments to figure that out. I can, I can before I execute them, I can figure out what this uh, compound is. 
So here's the general rule, is you need to define a relationship. So we just, we spoke about that now. We need to define a relationship to figure out what our confounding is. And we said that our confounding is found by the product of all possible generators. Notice that you'll always have P generators. So when we write our experiments down, the notation is 2 to the K minus P. So I'm doing, I'm investigating eight factors in four, eight experiments, so five. So I'm investigating seven factors, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? And I'm doing it in eight experiments. So P in this case is for K to seven. So that's that notation over here. There are four generators. My four generators then are, let's get them from the square. D is equal to AB. relationship, I need to take the product of all combinations of those defining relation of those generators. And this is where it gets messy. <laughs> it gets really, really messy here. There are, we can show mathematically that defining relationship will have two to the p words in it. So p in this case is four. I'm going to have 16 words in my defining relationship. The final result of your defining relationship is this big mess down here. My defining relationship is I, is ABD, is AC, is BCF, is ABCG, and so on. So how did I get that? Let's take a look. There are my four, my four generators. I is equal to ABD. So I can rewrite this first one as I equals ABD. <coughs> All I've done is I've multiplied both sides by D. That's all I've done to get that. Yeah, I multiply both sides by D. So I is equal to ACE, I is equal to BCF, and I is equal to ABCG. So there's my four generators. It says take the product of all combinations of your generators. Well, let's take the product of two of them at a time. So I can take the ABD multiplied by ACE. That's my first combination. So ABD multiplied by ACE. Well, A times A simplifies to unity. There's only one B, there's a D, there's a C, there's an E. So that simplifies down to B, C, C, E. So that's my first, first word in my defined relationship. My next one is I take the product of ABD with BCF. Then I take ABD product of ABCG. So that's how I build up that, that first row. So it's by combining two at a time. So I can take any two combinations and I'll end up with those words. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six words by combining them two at a time. If I combine them three at a time and simplify, I'll get an additional one, two, three, four words. If I combine them all four at a time, I get my final word. Add up all those words together, gets me 16. <coughs> so there's I as the first one, and then there's 15 others. That's my defining relationship. So it's a really messy process to actually get the defining relationship. And we have computer software in there. The shortest word in my defining relationship has three terms in it. 
This is an important point because it puts that Roman numeral in that table. That's going to be an important point in the next class where we look at what's called resolution. So the shortest word length in the defining relationship is three words here that have a length of three characters. Those are going to be what, what factors are called by my, my resolution. Now, before we go a little further with this, and I'll continue this example next time, you will be asking yourself, well, what is the purpose of all of this? Why do we go through this complexity? Especially, why do we do it ahead of time? Well, let's take a look at answering that. The main reason is the following. Let's go back to a simple example. We go back right back to this earlier one where we had this half fraction. We know before we even run the experiments that A is going to be confounded with B, C. C, B is going to be confounded with A, C, and C is going to be confounded with A, B. We know that ahead of time. If you know that the system you're dealing with has a two-factor interaction, you already know, in many cases in chemical engineering, we know that pressure and temperature interact. So if P was one of my variables, so pressure and temperature was another of my factors, I know that I'm going to get a significant effect there. I should find an interaction to pair it up with a main effect that I'm willing to sacrifice. Okay, so if I know, let's say temperature is defined as B and pressure is defined as C, I should pick factor A to be a main effect that I'm willing to sacrifice. If A is a main effect that I'm also interested in, then I should not be pairing it up with BC. I should pair it up with another variable that I'm willing to, to, to confound with. So people, the first question I ask, well, how can you go switch around things arbitrarily? Well, yes, you can. I, no one forces me to assign temperature to B and pressure to C. So you write, what we do is we write out our confounding pattern first, and then we go pick which variables we call A, B, C, D, and so on. That's the, that's the order of doing it. So here's, here's, your, here's your procedure. You're going to investigate a certain system. Well, you firstly, figure out what is your Y variable, what's your response. Secondly, figure out what variables are you going to investigate. You know that you're going to investigate a high number of variables. So then, figure out where you're going to be on that trade-off table. What's your budget for estimating that number of factors, and how many experiments can you fit into your time? Then you go write up the confounding pattern. You look at the confounding pattern, and you make a preliminary ass assignment of which factors go to which letter. And if you see any interaction in there that you want to be able to estimate, and it's confounded with something else, simply just go reassign your letters to something different. So you write out your confounding pattern once, and then you go assign your factors afterwards. It's not the other way around. It's not like you go write out your factors, assign them to the variables, and then find out that. And then if you're not happy with the confounding, you go change it up. Simply write out your confounding once, and then go pick what you go assign to A, B, C. So, so that's the general approach that you should be following. And it's the most economical approach to do to extract the most information in the fewest number of experiments. So what I'd like you to do for the next class is to go do these little homework items and then also go and continue on at least try and derive that defining relationship with yourself once a really next time.